We're really delighted you're all able to come to the STEPS annual lecture, which this year, um, I'm delighted to say, has been given by Kate Brayworth, whose title is up there, Economics as if we wanted to survive the 21st century. <laughs> My name's uh, Ian Scoons. I'm one of the co-directors, along with uh, Andy Serling, of the STEPS Centre, which is an ESRC centre based at Sussex between IBS and Screw in particular, but also stretching out to other parts of the university. And we always hold our annual lecture in May on the first day of our summer school, which is a highlight of our year, when we have around 40 participants from every country you can imagine. This year we've got 42, I think, participants from 25 different countries, all of whom are here in various states of jet lag, uh, <laughs> starting this morning. Now, the theme of this annual lecture is absolutely spot on for the STEP Centre. Rethinking economics for sustainability uh, is central to our mission. Um, and we're delighted that we can have this debate this afternoon. Because, of course, the debate that Kate and others are involved in is chiming with a wider debate about the role of economics in policy, the role of economics as contributing to debates about sustainability. And just in the last weeks, actually, through my door at home, I've had prospects come through, rip it up and start it again, the case for a new economics. Just this weekend, The Economist came through, and there was a, a quote in here saying, um, economics uh, could do with a new mindset. It's not what you normally expect in The Economist. And the week before, the headline, why Marx was right. That's even more <laughs> So there's something happening out there, and a bigger debate that uh, Kate is engaging with, and we're delighted uh, to have that. Um, the Financial Times, indeed, was debating this only a week or two ago, asking again in its headline, has economics failed? Well, the answer is no, but maybe we have to do some rethinking. And Kate's book, uh, which many of you have seen, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, is now a real bestseller, and I'm delighted to say it is, accompanied by a variety of online materials, a fantastic teaching resource. Uh, George Monbiot called Kate the new Kate. Might be slightly overblown, but anyway, we still appreciate that. Um, George very kindly giving that accolade. So Kate has worked in different places. Um, she'll give a little bit of background to herself in introducing where she's coming from with her talk. Um, she's currently associated with the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford and the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. Um, and before that, worked in Oxfam and the UN and elsewhere. So has feet in many, uh, in many settings, both in practice and in academia. And it's that connection which I think is really important that she's been, been making. And indeed, she came along to the Step Summer School and ran a session for us about five years ago in the build-up to Donut Economics. So we'll have to just take some credit for this great success <laughs> of, of this debate. But anyway, we're really delighted that she's uh, agreed to come. She has a very packed schedule. Um, and uh, we'd like to hear where the debate has gone and where it's going to. So, over to Kate. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Ian. And hi, I'm really, really delighted to be here, especially because I know it's the first day of the STEP Summer School. My students at the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford are sitting their exams this week, and I know that many of them would love to be on this summer school. It's really seen as a, uh, you know, a, a super cutting edge summer school to get a place on if you can. So congratulations for those of you who are here, and overcome that jet lag, because I know you're gonna have amazing conversations this week. Um, first way to think like a 21st century economist is really easy. Pick up this little piece of paper, and just fold it at the corner. There we are. And then it just turns into a little menu. That's it. If only everything was as easy as that. There you go. That, that's a little uh, menu of rethinking that I'm going to talk through this evening. And what I'm going to do is just set out the basic message that I've put out in this book. Some of you might be familiar with it from reading the book, but I hope for many of you 
It's a first whirlwind tour of what I call donut economics. And then I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we can have afterwards. So please challenge me, comment suggestions, questions. Let's make it a great conversation. So economics, as if we wanted to survive the 21st century. I know I certainly do. And I think that's one of the motivations that brings all of us into this room. A passion. A passion to make change happen in the world. And I'm going to just start by saying where I come from, because I always think when anybody stands up in front of you and starts talking, there's always that question of, well, who are you and what were you trained in? Or what's the mindset you learned? What experiences you have? What shapes the reasons that you choose to share these facts, stories, and perspectives today? So let me kick off with that. I was a teenager of the 1980s, like not very many of the people in this room, but the few of you who were, will remember, like me, growing up seeing a famine in Ethiopia and a hole open up in the ozone layer. And I remember the first time on the TV news being told that there's something called the greenhouse effect. And I remember the Exxon Valdez spewing oil out into Alaska's sand. And so by the time it was time to go to university, I just knew one thing, I wanted to help change the world. And I thought the best thing to do was to equip myself with the mother tongue of public policy to study economics. Because if I had that, I would have the language of power that could start acting on issues of social inequality and social injustice and protect the environment. So off I skip to university, there's me. The summer just before I turned up, reading my very first economics textbook by Lipsy. It was called Positive economics, positive meaning not normative, but value-free. I should have sniffed a rat from the beginning. <laughs> um, and I studied economics uh, for four years, but I was really frustrated by the theories I was taught. Because I found the issues I had come to this discipline with, social justice, protecting the living world, these were at the margins of the syllabus. You had to hunt them out. You could choose to do special papers in that if you wanted to. And so after four years of academic study of economics, I decided I didn't want to go further into the academia of economics. I wanted to immerse myself in the real world economy. So I went and worked for three years in the villages of Zanzibar as a fellow of the ODI, uh, working with barefoot entrepreneurs who were surviving with nothing but the forest, the community, and their wits. Then I spent four years working in, on a very different island in Manhattan working at the Human Development Report Office for the United Nations. And I'm so delighted because my boss is sitting here in the second row, Richard Jolly, was my boss, and I was his junior research assistant. And I had a fantastic time there, really learning to think about not economic development, but human development, reframing the project. Then I spent over a decade working with Oxfam, campaigning on the front lines of women workers' rights in global supply chains, trying to make visible unpaid care and work, trying to show that climate change is a matter of social justice and injustice, and trying to bring these together. Then I became a mother of twins, and I began to understand gender and gender politics like you never quite do to your changing two nappies at the same time. And at this point, I'm mean, looking back over my career, because this has been about 20 years by now, and every career story is really just a series of bad haircuts, but it's also that story of what you were searching for. And I realized that I spent about the first 20 years of my career trying to make visible the things that were left invisible in mainstream economics. Unpaid caring work, climate change, the injustices of global supply chains pushing costs and risks down on the most vulnerable people at the end. And I just thought, am I going to spend my whole life trying to make these things visible in mainstream economics? Or can I be part of a movement that actually wants to rewrite economics and puts these front and center? And then, of course, the global financial crisis kicked off. And many people began to question economics, some of those titles that, that Ian was just reading from. Start very much from a financial perspective. And I thought, if economics is going to get rewritten because of this financial crisis, I'll be damned if we're only going to rewrite financial economics. We have to bring in the story of the living world, we have to bring in social justice and human values and put those at the heart of a 21st century economics. So I left my beloved job at Oxfam and I immersed myself in reading all the economics texts that I'd never been taught, the ways of thinking that were not in my syllabus. I learned about ecological economics, feminist economics, institutional, behavioral, complexity economics, 
And I started to ask myself, what happens when these aren't all niches off in their own little disciplinary area with their own journals and their own conferences and their own blogs, but when you start to put them together and make them dance on the same page? And I started teaching at the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford at the same time, and really immersed myself in writing this book, Donald Economics which is the book I wish I could have read when I was a student because it would have helped me realize, you know, if things don't make sense, it might not be you, it might be the theory. And there is another way of looking at this. So I want to give you a whirlwind tour of that mindset that I put through in the book. And I was very uh, inspired by the words of Buckminster Fuller, that great American inventor of the last century, who said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Let's just tweak that for one moment. You never change things only by fighting the existing reality. Of course you have to fight the existing reality. And I stand with those who expose tax havens and corporate scandals and who chain themselves to oil rigs and who campaign against fracking to bring down the old reality. But we will never transform it if we only do that. You also have to bring up a vision of the new and show that there is a positive alternative that actually already exists and we can bring it through. So that's what I focused on. And he talks about build a new model. And often when it comes to economics, people think of a model as um, being a set of equations, as if that's where models begin. But equations almost are, are the ultimate, refined, mathematical expression of a model. Models start somewhere much more basic. I think almost all models are images, whether, we not, whether or not we actually draw them. They are pictures because they are descriptions of relationships between things. And I think pictures are profoundly powerful in shaping the way we think. Over half of the nerve fibers in our brains are linked to our vision. And when we say, I have in the back of my mind, there's a, a memory. The back of your mind is your visual cortex. And that's where pictures sit deep in our brains, shaping the way we think without us even knowing that they're there. But they're there and they really do influence us. So I wanted to redraw economics as a picture. And ridiculous though it sounds, it came out looking like a donut. So of course the health warning has to be said, because doctors won't forgive me otherwise. Don't eat too many donuts, they're not good for you. This is the only one that actually turns out to be any good for us. And so let me tell you what it is. I, I present it as a, a one way of drawing a compass for 21st century human prosperity. What our well-being could look like. And imagine from the center of that circle radiating out humanity's use of resources, which means that the hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short on the resources they need to meet all of their essential needs. To have enough food or water or healthcare or education, access to energy, social networks, income, political voice, gender equality. And these 12 dimensions in the middle, I crowdsourced them from the world's governments. So they are drawn from the sustainable development goals. There's a social priorities set out in the SDGs. So the world's governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these essentials of life. So we want to get everybody out of the hole, over that social foundation, into the green ring that is the donut itself. But, and it's a big but, at the same time, we can't overshoot that outer ring, with our collective resource use pushing us over these planetary boundaries that lie around the outside. And these are the idea that Earth system has been sustained in an incredibly benevolent and resilient state for around the last 11,000 years, thanks to a set of critical life-supporting systems that Earth system scientists call planetary boundaries. Whether it's about the stability of the climate system, not, not putting so much chemical pollution in the, in the world that we need to change the very nature of the web of life, not converting too much of Earth's surface for human use, preventing excessive biodiversity loss, keeping a protective ozone layer overhead, ample fresh water, bountiful biodiversity, healthy soils and healthy oceans. So put those two things together, and the simplest way I can say this is we need to meet the needs of all people, leave nobody falling short but do so within the needs of the planet. Don't overshoot our pressure on the stability and balance of this extraordinarily delicately balanced living planet on which all of our lives depend. And so that is the foundation that I would put forward as a compass for human prosperity. But of course it's not 
The prosperity itself, this isn't, doesn't guarantee human well-being. And the way I like to depict this is if you flip the donut on its back like a plate, then above it, if we were in that space where we meet the needs of all within the needs of the planet, this is the preconditions for enabling human flourishing. And here above it I've put, for example, Manfred Bax and Eve's ideas of fundamental human needs. That when we ensure that everybody can meet their basic needs within the needs of the planet, that allows the whole of humanity to begin to thrive. And I think there's some really interesting conceptual work that needs to be done. I just illustrated it with a picture, because I know pictures are powerful, but to turn these into something more deeply interconnected theoretically. The relationship between human flourishing and meeting those essentials of life. But if I offered this image to you as a compass, then, well, of course, you want to know where we are. And that's not an easy picture to look at. Because all this red shows us either that we are falling short on life's essentials or overshooting planetary boundaries. In the center of the circle there, you can see that on every one of those dimensions, there are millions or billions of people worldwide who are falling short on life's essentials. On food, for example, at the top, that little red wedge goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. On water next to it, 9% of people don't have access to improved water. One person in three worldwide doesn't have access to what we call a toilet. But on every one of those dimensions, you can see there are people that are falling short and they live in countries rich and poor. And yet at the same time, we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries. Climate change, that level is set at 350 parts per million. Last month, the average uh, global concentration of carbon dioxide was at 410 parts per million. This hasn't happened for hundreds of thousands of years. But we're over also on biodiversity loss, on excessive fertilizer use with nitrogen and phosphorus, and excessive land conversion. And we don't even know where we are on air pollution and chemical pollution. So, this picture, I, I hold it up as a snapshot of humanity in our planetary home. And we could consider it as our collective selfie. This is the picture of we, humanity, of the early 21st century. And we're the first generation to see this. None of last century's economists saw this picture. So why would we imagine that their theories were going to help us turn it around? None of last century's politicians or business leaders saw this picture. Why would we imagine their policies or their business models were equipped to take on the challenges that it presents us? I think this is a, a critical moment for us to see with new eyes what human prosperity depends upon, how we are out of balance on both sides, and it calls on us as a generational challenge to come up with theories and policies and business models of our own that actually enable us to meet the needs of all people within the needs of the planet. Because if we don't turn that around, we are seriously on track for a century that we don't want to create for our, ourselves, those living around the world, our children and grandchildren. So what would it take to turn this story around? I think many things need to happen to change, but we need to transform the conversation about economics that happens in parliaments around the world, that happens in boardrooms of companies, and that happens in the media. And to do that, to change that narrative of how the economy is talked about, you know, in The Economist and in Prospect, what the economy is, how it works. We need to transform the way economics is taught in economics departments because many of those people in parliaments, in boardrooms, in the media, they did a little bit of economics at university. Very, very few people do a PhD. I think the most important degree in economics is actually Econ 101 or the undergraduate degree because that is the most that most people study, and then go off and become a politician, a business leader, a journalist, a lawyer, an activist, and take that framing with them, and that becomes the narrative of public economics. So, how can we transform this so that we actually have a chance of surviving and thriving in the 21st century? Well, these are the faces of some of the founding fathers of economics, whether it's Paul Samuelson, John F. Keynes, Simon Kuznets, John Stuart Mill, Milton Friedman, Adam Smith, I could have put different faces there, but they would still all have a few things in common. <laughs> They're all men. <laughs> They're all white. They're all English-speaking. They're all from wealthy backgrounds. And these characteristics frame 
what we see and what we don't see, what we notice and ignore, what we put at the center of our theories and what we leave to the margins. And I think they have repercussions that we're still living with today. So the images at the heart of economics, when I drawn this donut diagram and was amazed by the impact it had five years ago, I realized the power of pictures and it drove me back to my textbooks to look at the pictures that I had been taught at the heart of my economics education. These innocent little scratchings, almost like cave art, that deeply frame the way we think and what we see and what we don't notice. And I want to give you a whirlwind tour of these because these images answer some of the most fundamental questions in economics that never actually get asked. They don't get asked because they don't need to be asked, because they're answered by the pictures wordlessly. Questions like, what is the economy? And what is it for? And how does it work? And who are we? So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of these questions. And we could have no better tour guide than this gentleman. This is Paul Samuelson, whose landmark textbook, Economics, was published 70 years ago this year. And Samuelson knew the power of writing textbooks and drawing pictures. He, he was a, he's actually a, an economist, economist. He did a lot of work in equations, very abstract mathematical stuff. But when it came to teaching economics for the masses, he knew the power of pictures. And as he said, I don't care who writes a nation's laws or crafts its advanced treaties, so long as I can write its economics textbooks. Mm -hmm. The first lick is the privileged one, impinging on the beginner's tabula rasa at its most impressionable state. Yes, Paul Samuelson thinks your mind is a blank slate and he wants to lick it. <laughs> and he has licked all of our minds because the diagrams he drew are the parents of the diagrams that we all still encounter in our, in our textbooks today. So he was teaching at MIT in the 1940s, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was teaching engineers and he was teaching them a little bit of economics on the side. So when he wanted to draw a picture for them of the economy, he drew it in a way that would make it easy for them. He drew it like a set of radiator pipes. And here you can see money flowing around and around between business and what he calls public, we would say, households. And it goes in a circular flow, like water flowing through pipes. You can even see it being pumped into the top. Now, there's a really important insight here, as there is in every diagram that I'm going to show you. They all capture something that was an insight, because these were clever people. But the insight that money has a circular flow it's crucial if you want to understand uh, national income accounts, if you want to even understand Keynes's point about the, the demand boost of the government spending to get the economy going again. But this diagram has changed only a little bit in the last 70 years. Today it looks more like this, and its students know it as the circular flow of, the of income diagram. So you've got the essential market relationships between households and business, where households provide labor and, cap and profit, sorry, households provide labor and capital, in return, they get wages and profit, and they can use that for consumer spending to buy goods and services. So the money goes round and round, and so do the resources. And that's the essential market relationship. And yes, there are some leakages. Not all money is used for consumer spending. Some get saved and put into banks, which then turn it into investment. Except we all now know that that's not true. That's not how banking works. <laughs> and that was the great revelation of the financial crisis, that banks create money bear as debt that bears interest. There's a pump right in the middle of that system, but I'm not even going to go to that story today. There are bigger fish to fry. Some of that money goes off as taxes. Governments then use that tax to put it to public spending. That's also not how government spending works. There is a magic money tree. But I'm not going to touch that one either today. And some of it goes for imports, but more money comes back in from exports. The point of this diagram, as you can see from its depiction, the economy is circular and closed. It's self-contained. And what these arrows measure, of course, is the flow of money. So it's great for measuring national income accounting. It's the basis for which GDP is calculated. But this is still the biggest picture that an economist, a mainstream economist, can show you of the economy today in 2018. And the blank spaces are extraordinary. This diagram makes absolutely no mention of the living world, of the energy and the living matter and materials that are drawn daily into the economy and spewed out as waste and pollution. It says nothing of the unpaid caring work of parents, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping that goes into raising children day after day, that went into raising every one of us. 
that makes labor fresh and ready for work. And it's silent on the commons, that place for people to come together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community, co-creating goods and services that they value. Well, if the biggest picture that we're taught of the economy is silent on the living world, silent on unpaid care, silent on the commons, three of the most fundamental sources of our well-being, this is not going to go well. This does not serve us, given what we know. What about who we are? It's a story that goes back to Adam Smith. And Smith, of course, had a nuanced view of humanity. He understood that markets are, are powerfully driven by self-interest, right? Self-interest is powerful at making markets work, but our interest in others is crucial for making society work. And he celebrated our generosity, our public spirit, our sense of justice. But this was too nuanced to create models. And so when later economists came along, like John Stuart Mill, really though he was, he did something not very useful. He said, political economy does not treat the whole of man's nature in society, nor the whole of his conduct, but sees him as a being who desires to possess wealth. And he just chose that thin slice of self-interest as the DNA of humanity and economics. And future economists came along and further caricatured this creature and turned him into what we now know as rational economic man, the portrait of humanity, the heart of economics. And he never gets depicted in the textbook, so I thought, well, everyone needs their picture, so I drew him. And he'd have to look something like this. He would be a man, standing alone, money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. And the really fascinating thing about this character is not just how absurdly narrow he is. The fascinating thing is what looking at him does to us. Because on being told that he is like us, we become like him. Research shows that for year one, to year two, to year three of study economics, students over time say that they value self-interest and competition rather than collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And if we're going to be more than 10 billion people living on this planet together this century, if we carry on imagining, conducting, and justifying ourselves as rational economic man, this is not going to go well. The model of man turned into a model for man, and we urgently need a new portrait of ourselves at the heart of this study. What about the story of how the economy works? This goes back to the 1870s, when a small band of economists were desperate to show that economics was a science. So they turned to the scientific great of the day, Sir Isaac Newton. Here's his diagram of gravity pulling a ball to rest. And so when William Stanley Jevons began drawing his economics diagrams, he drew them intentionally in the style of Newton. You can see he's echoing that Newtonian physics to show how scientific it is. As if to say, it looks like physics, it smells like physics, it must be as scientific as physics. And this diagram here, well, it's still actually the first diagram that any, every student learns in lecture one of economics. It's the underpinnings of supply and demand. As if to say, Welcome to economics, here's the market. As if the economy is the market and the market's in equilibrium. I find that an extraordinarily narrow place to begin economics. Because what does it do to everything else? The real challenge for me is that when we start with the market and things that are priced, that everything else is externalized. And I found that throughout my four years of study economics, if I wanted to talk about climate change, the breakdown of the living world, uh, chemical pollution, or the hole in the ozone layer, ecosystem degradation. I was offered two words, as you probably are still offered two words. Environmental externalities. <laughs> George Lakoff, the cognitive linguist, would say, this framing should raise alarm bells. If we are talking about the breakdown of the living planet on which all of our lives depend, as an externality, we already know something profoundly wrong is happening. And I've looked for the best depiction of the living world that I could find in mainstream economics. I sincerely invite you to, I sincerely invite you to show me a better one, but I do believe this is it. This is the supply and demand curves, and there's a gap between the private cost and the social cost. So the living world shows up as a gap between two lines. This is not going to go well. I sincerely believe if we think 
but that's not meant to be funny. <laughs> if we want to survive the 21st century, we cannot talk about the living planet of which we're a part as an externality when it gets damaged. We cannot depict it only as a gap between two lines. We urgently need to reframe the economics of survival. We also need to get away from the desire to be like Newton, because I think unintentionally, the economists who were inspired by Newton realized that he's made himself famous for posterity because he discovered the physical laws of motion. And I think this set economists off searching for economic laws of motion. And two apparent such laws have dominated all of our lives for decades. The first one here on social inequality. Simon Kuznets in the 50s had a little bit of data from the UK, Germany, and the US on what happens to inequality in a country over time as it gets richer. And he plotted them, he said, I think I see a pattern. That as economies get richer, inequality first increases, but then it decreases. And he couldn't understand it. He said, I wouldn't expect this. I'd expect the rich to get rich and not the poor to catch up. He tried to explain it. And he said it would be terrible if this became an unwarranted dogmatic generalization because he realized he had only scant data. But by the time the curve was drawn, not by him, but by people who followed, that curve takes on a life of its own. And it begins to whisper out a mantra. If you care about inequality, don't try to redistribute. You see, growth will even things up. Don't, you know, redistribution gets in the way of growth, and actually, what it seems to show is growth, after all, will even things up again. And this justifies trickle-down economics, it justifies austerity economics. Thomas Piketty came along and said, actually, Kuznets' data was right, but he was measuring it at a very particular moment in time, pre-war and post-war. And it's war that destroys the capital of the wealthy, and post-war governments invested in health, education, and housing. So it's war and government intervention that bent that curve down. It's not the inherent workings of the market. But the curve's already taken on its own life and justified trickle-down and austerity policies. In the mid-1990s, a second curve was drawn, named the environmental Kuznets curve, because it seemed to whisper the same message, but in respect to the environment and pollution. If you care about the living planet, don't try to regulate because you'll get in the way of growth. And actually, it seems that growth eventually, like a, like a well-trained child, will clean up after itself. <laughs> Except this is measured on local air and water pollutants. And when you take account of global impacts, the virtual impacts overseas, like global carbon emissions and material footprints, this curve does not bend down. So these are two false laws of motion that have had huge impacts in all of our lives. Trickle down economics, grow now, clean up later economics. In countries across the world, we need to dislodge these old ideas and replace them with new ones that are fit for our times. But of course, even though they've turned out to be false, they were jolly good for justifying that pursuit of growth. And this story again goes back to Paul Simon Kuznets because he was asked in the US 1930s by Congress to come up with one measure for uh, national outcome, and he, uh, national income, and he did. It's what we now know as GDP, but he said this can scarcely be taken as a measure of the welfare of a nation because it doesn't count the unpaid caring work of parents. It doesn't count the value created by communities, and it's just a flow measure. It says nothing of what's happened to the stocks of resources that have been converted to create this flow. He saw the whole story from the beginning, but the temptations of that number were so great, politicians pushed his caveats aside and ended up in a horse race pursuing GDP growth rates. So much so that even today in the world's richest countries, politicians still argue that the solution to their economic ills lies in more growth. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of these images. And when I point out the caveats, the blind spots, the shortcomings, the historical momentary nature of them, they seem incredibly flimsy. But I believe it's precisely in those blind spots and caveats that a very, very powerful story got built. Because back in the 1940s, a small band of economists met in a little Swiss village called Mont Pelerin. Milton Friedman, Friedman Hayek, and they wanted to create a new story of economics. They called it neoliberalism. And they were motivated, you always have to understand where people were coming from. They were smart people. They were motivated to by the, the fear of the rise of the totalitarian states in the USSR. So they wanted to push back against the state, and Hayek particularly believed that if you give the state an inch, it'll take the whole damn lot. 
So you have to minimize the role of the state. But this very quickly morphed into a market fundamentalism, the belief that the market, welcome to economics, market is the first best solution for everything. And their story didn't take hold for decades. They seeded it in chambers of commerce, in university posts, in uh, think tanks that they set up. They seeded it in political parties. It was only in the 1980s, in those years of my teenagehood, that Reagan and Thatcher came to power at the same time. And it was then that they together put the neoliberal story on the international stage. And I believe it's the story that many of our lives have been run by since. It's a story that stars the market because it's efficient, so give it free reign. It stars finance, we were told, is infallible, so trust in its ways. A story that stars trade, which is win-win, so open your borders. And since every good story has a villain, it stars the state, which is incompetent, so don't let it meddle. These were the main characters in that story, and Milton Friedman was the master storyteller. Other characters not really needed on the stage, but we could meet them anyway. The household, it's domestic, you can leave that to the women. The commons, as every student learns, the commons are tragic, the tragedy of the commons, so sell them off. <laughs> society, as Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society. It's non-existent, we can ignore it. Earth, Julian Simon said, is inexhaustible. So you can take all you want. And power, as for power in economics, well, we don't need to talk about power, this is after all, positive economics, value free. So we don't need to mention that. This was the script of neoliberalism, and we can hear it even today in the dialogue that many politicians across all political parties have inherited. But of course, behind the script, behind the storyline, is a very different story. And we get glimpses of that through the newspapers and through the headlines that just seem to come at us faster and faster. Whether it's a story of extraordinary levels of corporate financing of political elections, funding their own vested interests to be locked in place, whether it's a story of banks that actually have to be bailed out because they turned out not to be infallible at all, but just simply too big to fail. The story of corporations tricking the public in terms of either the quality of their products or the impacts of climate change. And the story of tax havens, corruption and extraordinary levels of global inequality. And I believe that this neoliberal story that has so successfully captured the political narrative and has become the economic story told in parliaments, in boardrooms, and in the media, has been driving us on this journey to the political <coughs> collapse. Heading for a world in which millions of people are falling short on life's essentials, we are over planetary boundaries, and we know that these things rebound, and we're already seeing the repercussions in terms of migration, in terms of uh, famines uh, and the hunger opening up in parts of the world where we thought that wasn't happening anymore, in terms of conflict re-emerging, water wars, this is not a future we want to create. So we have to turn the story around. So let me give you a whirlwind tour of what I believe can be the beginning of a 21st century economic story. And I'm going to kick it off, turn back to John Maynard Keynes. Because I, I love this quote from him from 1936. He said, economics is the science of thinking in terms of models. Yes. And there's a lot of very clever modeling that goes on. But it's joined to the art of choosing models that are relevant to the contemporary world. And I think if Keynes were alive today, and if he saw that donut diagram <laughs> and saw the new reality, he would be the first to say, let's stop doing ever more clever models. It's time to return to the art of creating relevant models, and for all that you need for that is a pencil. Let's start drawing the basics again. It may seem like child's play, but the very basic pictures we draw go the deepest and frame how we do and don't see the world, what we do and don't notice. So I think Keynes will be a very keen 21st century economic artist. And let's start economics with a question that I was never invited to ask in my degree. And I'm going to guess that people, maybe in this room, if you've studied mainstream economics somewhere in the world, haven't also been asked. Which is purpose? The question of what is the economy for? I was never invited to actually ask that question. And I would say one way of talking about what the economy is for is, I offer you the donut. It's one way of framing the economy is for meeting the needs of all people within the needs of the planet. Now, if you want to disagree, even better, because now we've got a discussion. 
Now we can debate and reflect what's here, what's missing, what else could be the economy before, but let's at least have that conversation. Because if we don't know what the economy is for, how on earth will we know what economic success looks like? How will we know when things were going well? So I will begin with purpose. But then second, let's start with what will be the first diagram of the economy you teach? I would never start with supply and demand, even though courses today still do that. Let's start with a big vision. And I start with this diagram that I call the embedded economy diagram. If you are familiar with ecological economics, feminist economics, and commons theory, you'll see that I try to combine them together here. So the essence of it is that the economy is embedded in society, its social, cultural, political institutions, embedded in the living world, drawing in materials and matter and energy, spewing out waste and pollution, bathed in that river of solar energy. So right from day one, we can ask the core question of ecological economics. How big can the through flow of energy and matter be before we begin to disrupt this delicately balanced living planet on which we depend? But also look within the economy. It's not just the market and the state. That was such a 20th century ideological boxing match that occupied people. You know, are you a free market laissez-faire capitalist or are you a state-loving socialist? And in that boxing match, we lost sight of these two other fundamental forms of provisioning. The household, where we all begin every day, with our cooking, washing, caring, sweeping, cleaning, for our children, our parents, our partners, ourselves. And, and the irony is that when you're a student, that's almost the moment in your life that you're plucked from the household and living in a more institutional setting. So least exposed, least aware of the hours that go into household alongside the paid economy. But of course it's crucial. And then the commons, where we come together, not through the market, not through the state, there's a community, whether we're creating a, a, a garden on the corner of your neighborhood block or Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. And of course it's the work of Eleanor Ostrom, that has made the commons resurgent, that made people realize it doesn't have to be a tragedy, it can be a triumph. She went to the places where the commons were triumphant and she said, why is it working here? Very different form of reasoning. And I think the digital commons, the online commons, mean that the commons are gonna be one of the most dynamic sources of innovation in the economy this century, so we'd be crazy to ignore it. And those four forms of provisioning, each one with unique characteristics, work together. And I, I wouldn't want to live in an economy that lacked any one of them. But they often work best when they work together. Think of enterprises that, that work with the Creative Commons but build a niche market, or public-private partnerships, or market, uh, uh, commons public partnerships, or how a household interacts with the commons or the market. We need to think about these relationships and the power between them, because we've lived through nearly a century where the market was predominant over all of those other forms of provisioning and we need rebalancing, which for that the state is essential, to rebalance those relationships. And then there's finance in the middle. It should be a financial service. Fancy that. <laughs> financial <laughs> services in service to the functioning of those forms of provisioning, in service to life. And finance is designed, so who gets to create money? character it's given, whether it bears interest or demurrage, and what it can be used for. These are designs, and we can design finance to be in service to the kind of economy that actually meets the needs of all within the needs of the planet. One of the most fascinating and demanding questions of 21st century economics, what kind of financial system would that be? What about humanity? We're so much more interesting than rational economic man. Yes, we can be self-interested, but we're socially reciprocating too. We are the most social of all mammals, even more social than the naked mole rat, when it comes to socializing with those beyond our immediate next of kin. And yes, we can be, you know, competitive, but we are collaborative too. As a mother of children, and as any parent knows, you so much of your work as a parent is to nurture that collaborator, that connector. Mm. Of course there's the competitor. Go run a race. But work with your family, work with your friends. That's what makes teams and that's what makes groups thrive. We're told in, in emotional economics that we have fixed preferences. We arrive at the marketplace with our preferences and we, then we search to maximize efficiency. But actually, we're deeply fluid. And I'll give you an example. If I gave a survey to the room asking you to fill in your values and preferences, and here the front page said, this is a consumer reaction study. And here it said, it's a citizen reaction study. And here it said, it's a community reaction study. Research shows you all fill it differently. 
Because just with one word, I've activated the consumer and the citizen and the community member. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. Even by the name by which we're called shapes our response. We are that fluid. And we're not work hating. I think actually more accurate is purpose seeking. Think of the people who work for free, work to 2 a.m. on a project they love because they're driven by the purpose. And rather than being dominant over nature, we're embedded in the web of life. So this new model and this new understanding of humanity, of course, is beginning to come through from whether it's uh, behavioral economics or neurolinguistics or sociology, anthropology, but we couldn't paint this new portrait fast enough because if who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become, we urgently need this richer picture of ourselves at the heart of 21st century economics. And how does the economy work? Of course, that's complex. So these loops at the heart of complexity theory, like I said, you never got the joke about why did the chicken cross the road. He wanted to teach you systems thinking, right? So here's a reinforcing feedback that really are, the more you have, the more you get, the more chickens you have, the more eggs you get. And anything that spirals up or down is dominated by reinforcing feedback. But then there's the balancing feedback loop. The more you have, the less you get back. The more chickens you have, the more try to cross the road, the more they try to cross the road, the fewer make it back. And our bodies are dominated by balancing feedback, which is why we are all almost the same temperature. Our bodies keep rebalancing us. Most things that thrive and survive are dominated by balancing feedback. But it's the interaction of these loops. Throw in some delay, throw in some effects from other loops, and you've got an explanation of the most fascinating dynamics of the world, whether it's a murmuration of starlings, or the boom and bust of the stock market, or the rise of the 1%, or the collapse of ecosystems. And so starting with complexity and feedback effects is a far smarter place to start than with equilibrium. And if we are going to start with complexity and recognize that our economy is a complex, evolving, adaptive system with emergent properties, then rather than believing it follows these laws of motion that, that growth will even things up and growth will clean things up, I think we need to put principles of design at the heart of economics. Because we can't control the economy, but we can steward it, as Donella Meadows, the systems thinking thinker, taught us. And if we want to create an economy that meets the needs of all within the needs of the planet, I think we need to put two design principles at the heart of 21st, economic, 20, 21st century economics. To create an economy that's regenerative by design and one that's distributed by design. I'll say a little bit about what I mean by each of those. So, distributed by design. Very simply, I think many of the technologies and institutions of the 20th, 20th century were centralized. Think of uh, fossil fuel generation from an oil rig or a coal mine or a pipeline. Centralized technologies. Think of the corporation that brought together large amounts of capital to build a large factory or a large project, centralizing and then selling the products to many. And in the 21st century, we can create technologies and institutions that actually are more intentionally distributive by design. In fact, when we think about distribution, I think the 20th century, if you talk about distribution, it's about redistributing income. And I think we have a chance to go deeper and pre-distribute the sources of wealth creation. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean. So in housing, these houses are built in uh, Chile and Argentina by the, the architect Alejandro Alavena. He realized that many people just could never afford to buy a house. It was too expensive. So he thought, well, maybe they could buy half a house. So he started building half houses with all the water and heating and plumbing that you need and electricity. And then when they had enough money, they could fill the rest of it in themselves. <laughs> making housing far more distributive and accessible, or you can have mutual ownership of community housing groups. Many different distributive designs. In terms of enterprise, we don't have to have shareholder-owned stock corporations. There's a return, a resurgence of employee-owned enterprises, the fastest growing sector of business in this country, employee-owned enterprise, or cooperatives. And here, cooperatives in the US have moved into some places where, in the Rust Belt, the, the industries left because the wage rate fell in another state or another country. And cooperatives have begun working, whether it's in laundries or installation of solar panels. Local states realized that they should give them a tax cut because cooperatives and employee owned enterprises are sticky. They stick around because they belong, they're rooted in the community. They don't up and leave when the wage rate falls in the neighboring town. 
So there's something about local resilience and connectedness that comes from this local ownership. Energy systems, there's uh, rooms in uh, Germany that the solar panels are being built straight into the design of the housing. Every house, a mini power station, quite the opposite of the 20th century fossil fuel economy. And then uh, here, this is a, a, a fab lab or a maker space in the US where community members can come and use 3D printers, open source software, the Creative Commons, that open distributed design of the internet, not just in the US, but here in um, Lome in Togo as well, bringing how to create a computer to this community way faster than the private sector is ever going to have the incentive to do so. And for the first time in human history, energy and information, the technologies of these, are distributed by design. They look like a network from space because of renewable energy networks, because of the internet. We have to harness that unprecedented opportunity to find ways to create economies that match that are distributed by design. What about regenerative by design? Through the middle of this diagram is the degenerative linear 20th century economy. Right, we take those materials, we make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And that cuts against the cycles of the living world. So we have to bend those arrows around so that we are creating an economy that works with and within the living world. And this is, of course, a circular economy or a cyclical economy or a cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy. I see these as cousin concepts but underpinned by a set of shared principles. It's an economy that runs on sunlight. We look up, not down, for energy this century. It's an economy in which waste from one process is recognized to be food for the next. So this, this counter here should never end up in a skip because the materials are like a battery charged with energy that can be reused, refurbished, remanufactured into other uses. It's an economy that needs to be modular by design so that you could take apart something and replace just the bit that's broken. Let me show you the difference of modular by design. Two smartphones, very different. This is an iPhone. It's glued shut, so nobody that but Apple can get in. And if it wants to be refurbished in the circular economy, I have to send it back to Apple. But this is a fair phone, and it's designed to be open on purpose. It says on the back, yours to open, yours to keep. And you can go on YouTube, and there's a video telling you how to open it, how to replay, replace the parts, how to upgrade it, how to refurbish it. It's modular by design. It also happens to be made with supply chains that aim to be free of labor exploitation. So this is a very 21st century phone. And shifting from the idea of ownership to service, so you don't need to own the lighting, the light bulbs, you own lighting services. Even you don't need to own your jeans or your shoes, you own the, the services from them in return. These are some of the principles underpinning regenerative design. A couple of examples. In the slums of Kenya, one of the places where there were no toilets, there are now, because Sanji set up a micro-franchise throughout the community. So if people can use a toilet for the first time that has clean water, soap, and toilet paper. That brings dignity. It also brings health, tackling diarrhea and cholera, diseases that kill children needlessly in communities like this. But the waste is collected every day and turned into organic fertilizer sold back to farmers to put on their fields. So at the technical level, they're closing the loop of nutrients and nitrogen and phosphorus going around the economy. But at the social level, they're creating a distributive economy where creating enterprise throughout the community. This car from Open Motors, if you buy one of their cars, it looks like that when it arrives, like a, a wardrobe from Ikea. And if you can have a go at putting it together, but the thing is, if you don't know how to put it together, you can take it to somebody who knows, because they say it can be assembled in under an hour. I'd like to see it. Because the design of it is open source, on the internet, for anyone to see. This is the hardware, this is how you put it together. So anyone worldwide can set up as an assembler of an open motor chassis. And once you've got the chassis, then it can be customized to make it an electric street vehicle, an airport buggy, a golf buggy, whatever it's needed for in different parts of the world. To me, this is the beginning of 21st century regenerative, distributive, modular by design manufacturing where we don't ship complete cars around the world, we ship the parts and refurbish and repair and customize and reuse all over the world. And then this is the Swedish sportswear company, Houdini, who make all of their clothing either from wool and tensile, which can be decomposed back into compost, or from recycled polyester and recycled nylon. And they bring the clothes back and recycle that. Now, their clothing is expensive. Of course it's expensive. Like it was expensive to put a solar panel on the roof of your house in 1975. But if the standards and the methods become the standard way that things are done, 
the price starts to come down at Costco, and what's extraordinary becomes ordinary, and locked in is the mainstream standards, and this will become the way that things are done. This will become the reuse of textiles worldwide. So if we want to create economies that are regenerative and distributed by design, have an economy that pre-distributes access to the sources of wealth creation, and that works with and within the cycles of the living world, I think these are the principles, and there may be, of course, many more, but these are two that jump out to me that need to be at the heart of a thriving 21st century economy that meets the needs of all people within the needs of the planet. So it leaves me with that question of what does that mean for growth? Because today we have economies that need to grow, whether or not that makes us thrive. We are locked into a growth mentality. Our economies expect, demand, and depend upon endless GDP growth because we're addicted to it. We're financially addicted through a financial system that pursues the maximum rate of financial return, putting pressure on shareholder-owned companies to show every quarter they have growing sales, growing profits, and growing market share. We're financially addicted, um, but we're also financially addicted because banks create money as debt-bearing interest, which drives the need to grow to repay that interest. We're politically addicted. No politician wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if their economy stops growing while the rest of it's going, well, they'll be booted out by Nigeria or Malaysia or Vietnam. And politicians want to raise tax revenue without raising tax rates. Well, growing GDP is the easiest way to do that. And we're socially addicted. We've been convinced by a century of consumer propaganda that we transform ourselves every time we buy something more. This is almost the mode of delight for consumer mentality, the promise of what's in those bags of transformation of renewal. I don't think these addictions are insurmountable, but we need to pay them so much more attention if we're going to figure out how to create economies that thrive, whether or not they grow. Because if you look to nature, who's been thriving for 3.8 billion years, pretty good example to learn from. Nothing in nature grows forever. Things grow and then they grow up and mature. And it's by doing that that they come to thrive, so why would we imagine our economies are the one system that are actually going to succeed by bucking that trend and growing forever? I think the real existential economic question we face is how to create economies that make us thrive, whether or not they grow. Because we need a transformation right now. High-income countries need to become regenerative and distributive, and there's a lot of investment and transformation. That may well stimulate growth. So I'm not, I'm not with those who say we need degrowth now. We need to transform. Some things will grow, some things need to die. We need economies that can absorb and enable growth as we make that transformation to something different, which is a future I don't believe will be one driven endlessly by growth. Remember, in thriving systems, things that thrive are usually dominated by balancing feedback, not by reinforcing <coughs> feedback forever. So let me pull back and say I think that we need the beginnings of a 21st century economic story. And this one stars Earth because she's life-giving. So we have to respect her boundaries. It stars society because it's foundational. So we need to nurture our connections, local and global. It stars the household, its core of where we begin every day. How do we value that contribution? It's a story that stars the market. Of course it does because the market's incredibly powerful. So how do we embed it wisely? It stars the commons, they're creative, and their creative is only going to grow this century. So how do we unleash that potential? And it stars the state, because the state is essential. How do we make it accountable? As for finance, it should be in service. How do we make it serve society? Business is incredibly innovative, so how do we give it purpose beyond maximizing shareholder returns? Trade is double-edged. How do you make that fair? And power is, of course, everywhere. We need to talk about it, and we need to check its abuse. And I believe this kind of simple, clear language is the beginnings of a 21st century narrative of the kind of economy that we need to create if we want to survive this century, and more than survive, thrive. Of course, I believe it comes with new pictures, because pictures are powerful, and we need to embed this new vision in our visual cortex, deepest, where it shapes the way we think without us even really realizing it. So let me pull back and say that I showed you the faces of last century's economists at the beginning. And one of the things that delighted me when I finished writing this book was I, I sort of stepped back and thought, who has really influenced the way I'm thinking here? And I was struck to realize that many of those people were women. 
not all writing about the unpaid care economy. We've got here Danella Meadows, is the mother of systems thinking, Marianne Mazzucato, fantastic thinking about the state. She's got a new book out just now about value and the meaning of value, extractive versus generative value. Janine Benyus, uh, a leading thinker in biomimicry and learning from life. Ellen Ostrom, of course, the only woman ever to win a so-called Nobel Prize in economics on her work on the commons. So many women, but also people who came from not empire countries, but colonized countries, countries that were dominated. And they saw things that the dominators never saw. It's no surprise that Amartya Sen, son of India, did not come in with the market. He came in with human needs. And he started with capabilities and entitlements. It's no surprise that Haji Chang, growing up in South Korea, where it was called the third world country, and now is one of the richest countries in the world, has a very different understanding of industrial, industrialization and international political relations than is taught in the mainstream textbooks. So to me, this is a celebration, because 21st century economics is massively enriched by people whose perspectives on life come from a different place from last century's economics. Our diversity makes us all richer because none of us can see all of it. And we bring in perspectives that were missing and not noticed. So our economics is only going to get better by being more diverse. Just to finish off, if you're interested in the idea of what the donut can do, some researchers at Leeds University took it and scaled it down to the national level. They've created over 150 national donuts. You can see here that you've got countries like the UK and Australia nearly meeting everybody's needs at a very low global level, overshooting planetary boundaries. You've got other countries like Sri Lanka, <coughs> Not overshooting any boundaries, but many people still falling short. Is any country in the world in living within the donut? No. Vietnam is the one they say is the closest at the moment. But I'm not surprised that no country's there, because no country's tried to get there. This is a new aim, a new objective. But these, I think, are the metrics by which 21st century policymakers should be held to account. <coughs> And finally, if you're interested in the ideas of donut economics, you're welcome to read the book, but hey, there's so many books in the world. You could just get in seven minutes flat if you want. I had the privilege of working with some of the world's best stop motion animators, and we made one minute videos of each of the seven ways to think set out in my book. You can see that they're silly and playful and irreverent. I want to make economics accessible and fun for a far wider group of us, because everybody needs to be part of a 21st century economic conversation. And if you want to be part of that conversation in donut economics, there's an online discussion group where people are talking about using it for distributive design, for business, for cities, in teaching, in different languages. Please join. I'd be delighted to chat with you there. So I'm going to stop there, but this is really where the conversation begins. So thank you very much. Let's have a great discussion.